All right, so we began last week. I'm going to begin again this week at the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, where God created men and women in his own image. And, and God created the first, the first marriage, the first wedding, by bringing Adam and Eve together in this relationship, male and female. He created him. So what's really important to understand and to see deep in your heart is the fact that you are an image bearer of the living God. You are not God. You are an image bearer of God. You reflect him to the world. Consider, for example, the role of the moon. That we look up and you say, oh, the moon is, is really bright tonight. The moon itself is actually not bright. It, the moon is reflecting the sun, isn't it? So it's the sun that's bright, and it reflects off the moon, and then you see the, the, the reflection of the sun through the moon. You can look at humanity as image bearers, both created male and female, as, as a reflection of the image of God. And it's really important for us to know that God created us in his image. And as uh, families procreate uh, by God's grace, if you're able to do that, you're able to... to uh, you're able to spread the image of God throughout the world, and more of God's image is seen throughout the world. It's important because the image of God, uh, you as an image bearer, is not an abstract theological concept. It, it provides the basis for how we understand and how we approach every area of our lives, including family. And so the family portrays, the family that we looked at last week, this idea of family and this orthodoxy of family, right thinking around family, is that God portrays himself, the gospel, and the church. So in the family, God has embedded pictures of himself, his plan of salvation, and his redeemed people in that family. Being created in the image of God is super significant. Super significant. We reflect God to the world around us. We talk about this idea that God created us, male and female, created in his image, in the likeness of God. What does this tell us about the nature of manhood and womanhood as both male and female exhibiting full and equal humanness as the image of God? Well, we're distinguished, aren't we? We are male, not female, and female, not male. God created us male, and he created us female in his image, image bearers. This matters to our understanding of family because if God designed the family unit to consist of a, a male and a female brought together in the covenantal relationship of marriage, the idea of one flesh, two becoming one, as God brings the two together, and by his grace, you know, you might have kids, if, if we don't understand what male and female is, we looked at family, but what is male and female? If we don't understand that, how are we going to understand the dynamic of the family? So we're going to look at kind of from a specific vantage point this morning. While male is fully hum human, male is also male, not female. And while female is fully human, female is also female, not male. So while God did intend to create male and female as equal in their essential nature as human, he also intended to make them different expressions of that essential nature as male and female reflecting different ways of being human image bearers. So we are created as image bearers, but we are created male and we are created uh, female. There's a distinction that God created. Men are not women. And women are not men. Even though both men and women are created as image bearers of God. That's God's good design. God's good design is that he created male and female. He created us with distinctions to reflect the image of God to the world. But he didn't create male and female exactly the same. That should be obvious to us. There are God-given differences between men and women. We should celebrate those differences, and we ought to realize that those differences between men and women complement one another. This, throughout, this idea of men and women being uh, distinct and, and different, equal as image bearers, but distinctly different as male and female, this idea has been known throughout the majority of history. This has not been in question until the last number of 
years. The majority of history has not wrestled with this question of what is a male and what is a female. So when we consider today's sexual revolution and this idea that there, there's these blurred lines between uh, a man and a woman, you know, you, you have this message today that tells us that men can have babies and men can have their periods. Like, what the heck is that? It's insane. And so, so, so men who think they're women are absolutely, as you've seen as you look at the media, men who think that they're women are destroying in female sports. Biological males who think that they're women are competing in, in, in female sports and dominating. You might have heard even recently in the last week this, uh, this transgender swimmer, Leah Thomas, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, is making news because absolutely destroying in women's swimming. Like the next closest competitor in the last uh, big race was 38 seconds behind Leah. Men and women are created different, and that's okay. That's okay. When we typically talk about both men and women, we do so primarily by identifying men and women by what we do. Uh, you're a man because you do this or you do that. All right? However, there's more to who we are than sim- by simply uh, by what we do. Although what we do as a male and female is an essential expression of who we are, who we are and, and what we do, they, they really are tethered together. So we're going to look at this a little bit together. And we're going to be talking this morning specifically about uh, men and fathers. And for you ladies, you hear that? There might be a temptation for you to sort of check out. Ah, this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with you. This is equally important for you as it is for every uh, ma- man in this building this morning. And I want to challenge you ladies to raise the bar for the men in your life. Raise the bar. Far too many women, they settle for lesser than God desires for those men to be. Too many women settle for Peter Pans rather than for men. Too many women settle for boys who think they're men and will never grow up. Right? So this is really important. This is important for whether you're married. This is important whether you're single and you desire to be married. It's really critical for those that are single to understand what does God call a man? What should a man look like? What should I be pursuing? Uh, and, and what should I be looking for when I look and uh, date uh, uh, a man? So let me ask you a question. This is an out loud question so you can respond to me. Uh, what does it mean to be a man? To protect? Okay. Sorry? To be faithful? A breadwinner? Okay, perhaps, yeah. What does it mean to be a man? A provider? Kind? Huh? A leader? Strong, safe? Interesting. Interesting uh, answers that you've given. Now, if, if I was to ask that same question in different places of the world, the, the answer would be different in some respects. For example, in western Kenya, there's a tribe there that covers boys around 10 years old in the uh, feces and entails of cows and circumcises them in front of the tribe, inspect, expecting them while this is happening not to flinch, and then they determine them a man. Good thing we don't do that here. I'm sure we would definitely fill the theater if that's what we were doing. Okay, it, it, there's, there's a Kenyan tribe, for example, that um, entry into manhood is, is uh, removing some of the boy's teeth. Yeah. Or um, in the Brazilian Amazon, uh, boys must stick their hands in specially made gloves that are filled with bullet ants whose neurotoxin sting is said to be among the most agonizing in nature. And that's how they become men. So is manhood a a code of values passed down from men to their sons? Is that what it is? You know, you're a man if you can drink the most beer and burp the loudest. So the the world offers conflicting views, doesn't it, what being a man is all about. 
So in the West, it seems in the last 10 years of our culture, uh, what culture wants for men is to stop being men and instead to be women. Why? Because men are toxic. And as culture changes, it communicates more and more than ever before that if you're a male, you need to become more like a female and vice versa. So today's belief about gender are shifting rapidly and and radically, and that uh, affecting change of our culture deeply affects the family. There's many ideas around the world about what it means to be a man. Can these things truly define masculinity? If you get your teeth knocked out, does that mean you're a man? Or is there another standard? Well, it doesn't take much to look at the world, and many sociologists would agree, they all agree today that there's this crisis among men in terms of what it means to be one. So today, growing up as a man, you are more likely to have grown up without a male or a father in your life, You're more likely to get divorced. You're more likely to delay marriage, play video games for two hours a day between the ages of 18 and 35, and not be part of a church. Statistically, that's the the shape we're in here. So we, we can't rely on culture to determine what it means to be a man, because in every culture, there's just dramatic differences on what it means to be a man and how a man arrives at manhood. So as Christians, we are shaped, our worldview is shaped by the word of God. So, so we look to God's word and we say, you know, God's word, what, what, do, what does God's word say about this or about that? And, 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 and our worldview is shaped around the word of God. And, and that truth transcends all cultures, times and places. And, and that's where we look to find out what it means to be a man. So God has given us the Bible to help us. It's designed for our good. It's designed for human flourishing. And we align ourselves as Christians to what God says in his word, even if that flies in the face of what the predominant uh, narrative is in our culture. So we take God's word and we align ourselves to God's word. We don't take God's word and try to play theological gymnastics with it so that it will align with whatever it is that we want to do with our own lives. We align ourselves to God's word. So to be a man actually means something. So we need to know what a man is. And uh, let, let me kind of give you a big idea this morning. So manhood is not a lifestyle option. Rather, manhood is something built into the very being of a man by our creator. So let's consider this this morning. What does it mean to be a man? Apart from what we do, what is a man in the most basic God-given sense? Okay, this is an important question because only the combination of being a man and acting like one constitutes true manhood. Okay, there, there are two essential parts to this, and this is what we want to look at. The first one is the, the divinely ordained fact of being a man, so there's maleness, and secondly, the man's deriv- derivative nature or behavior of acting like men, masculinity, acting like men, okay? So if we, if we immediately skip to behavior, to the characteristics of masculinity without some understanding of male identity, then we run the risk of uh, short-circuiting manhood as mainly about what we do, mainly about what we do, and we leave room for misunderstanding for what manhood uh, is, and we think it's it's a lifestyle option rather than something that's built into us by our creator. All right, so in the book Designed for Joy, the author says this, what a man is and how he acts is important because this says something about the God who made him. We shouldn't jump ahead to roles without knowing why. There's more for us to see. What makes men men or women women is intrinsically connected to the majesty of the God in our design. We each exist as we do in order to display that glory. We're made for this. So God's goal in manhood as well as God's goal in womanhood as equal image bearers of God is that we would know him. Our creator. So let's look at this passage together. Psalm 1, 1 to 6. It says, Blessed is the man 
who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. It goes on and it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. But all are like chaff, and the wind drives them away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. All right, so let's look at this first point here. Um, for the, let, let, me, let me keep going here, because uh, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And the next part is... For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Okay, let's just look at this. I know we're covering this a lot. It feels heavy, right? Let's look at the first one here. The divinely ordained fact of being a man. Okay, let's look at this maleness, this divine fact. So 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14 says this. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. That all you do. So we have, to, we have to ask, what is maleness? Because then after considering what it means to be a man, can we most responsibly ask what it means to act like one? So maleness plus masculinity equals true malehood. Okay? Maleness plus masculinity equals malehood. So much of what it means to be one and not the other, to be male and not female, to be female and not male is left to natural theology, right? The Bible is not a science textbook. And sometimes people approach the Bible because they want to know the, every kind of thing that's going on in the world and, uh, and think that the Bible is a science textbook. That's not what the Bible was created for. It was not created to be a science textbook. That wasn't its design. Right? The Bible doesn't tell us about chromosomes. It doesn't need to, right? In those in those instances when anatomy is the topic. So scripture doesn't make the case for our differences, but it assumes that we already know them. Right? It assumes we already know that men and women are different. It really doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Right? That we're different. I don't need to convince you, for example, that the sky is blue. You just assume that because you look up and you say, oh, the sky is blue. This, this is some in some respects, is why the, the trans movement is so confusing. Um, to think a male can be a female just because they believe that is very confusing. It's very confusing. I, I mean, I, I can believe that I can fly, but I'm going to have um, the hard reality of truth when I try to jump off a building to do so. We, we know that the biblical writings assume the differences as seen so clearly in, for example, the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon's all about uh, this marital relationship, and there's dynamics between the wife and the husband, and it's, uh, it, it's, quite a, it's quite a book, it's quite a journey. So scripture's virtual si- silence on these specifics suggests that we understand it naturally, you look at a man, you look at a woman, you recognize that, by, that just physically there are differences, and, uh, and you go, that's, that's reasonable. Without going into a great detail, there's, this, there's a reality of natural revolution that's uh, evolution, uh, revelation, natural revelation that's seen in three perspectives. Let me just quickly give you the three perspectives. The first one is this, that sex is biological. It's recognized in the observable world. There's there's a chromosomal marker that separates and makes a distinction between men and women. The second one is gender is sociological. There's There's a cultural marker, albeit today it's getting confused, but there's a cultural marker recognized in the perceptions of masculinity and femininity in human society. All right, marred by sin, no doubt. The third one is gender identity is psychological. There's, a, con- there's a, a, a conscious marker, if you will. It's recognized as an individual's personal interaction with the observable world within human society. So to put it more plainly, it's this. 
being a male is to uh, naturally have male parts, male traits, and a male sense. So, so we're clear, none of, no, not, no one of these three perspectives testifies to our sexuality on its own. They all work together. All three vantages on one whole. So to form our identity as male or female. And that information is adequate in almost every case, even if the perspective is blurred by our sin-tainted world. So this is what it means to be a man. This reality of maleness is a fundamental aspect of manhood exclusively given to us by our creator God from which the man answers the masculine call. The second one is this, the man's derivative behavior of acting like men. Okay, so, so when I asked you what is a man, almost every one of your responses is that the, there, is a, there is an action that happened, you know, that, that they, they were they, protecting or, or uh, providing, they were doing something. So what does it mean to act like a man? What are the implications for the family when men act? Like men. Well, let's look at 1 Kings 2 1 to 3. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of the earth. He's about to die. So that means, be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. So, so David commands Solomon to show yourself a man. The, the word translated here, man, does imply male as opposed to female. So Solomon is to demonstrate characteristics that are foundational to God's design for masculinity as he takes the throne and he succeeds David as the king of Israel. So masculinity is not simply maleness. Just because you have male parts doesn't make you necessarily masculine. Okay? So, so the idea of, of masculinity is not just tied to anatomy. So equally, equally, just because you can biologically have children doesn't make you a dad. Right? There's more to being a father than just showing up nine months before the child is born. Right? So, so what is of critical importance in this passage is how, how David defines a man. Solomon will show himself a man first if he is strong. You know, this doesn't mean primarily physical strength or physically strong, but rather it's an internal strength and an internal fortitude. However, I, we, men and women are created differently, aren't we? And, and, uh, and often, Men are more physically stronger than women. That's okay. That's okay. A, a, a man is to use that, that physical strength to be a protector and a provider. It's, it's, it's not to abuse. So I, I, I struggle so much when I look at culture and I see so many times the, this idea that, that being a male, we need to sort of strip away that. We need to see the male characteristics and the, the things of masculinity as being so, so awful and we need to turn men into women and we need to talk down to men and you gotta, we watch TV and you see all these sitcoms that make men look like idiots. I, I'm, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of that. God created men, and he create, created men distinctly different, and we should celebrate those things. As David is talking about Solomon, he says that he is to be resolute in his beliefs and his character and his in integrity. He is to be firm as to what he stands for and in the carrying out of justice. He's to do his part to see God's will prevail in the kingdom. He is to courageously stand tall in battle. He's to be courageous when it comes to standing for truth and the laws of God. Courage is so important. Men are to do what is right even when it's hard. Men are to do what's right even when it's hard. 
For years, as our kids are going out for school, I would say often as they'd be leaving out the door, I would say to our boys, make sure you guys do what's right even when it's hard. And there's been times throughout their schooling where they would witness uh, uh, a bully picking on some kid and knowing that they need to do what's right even when it's hard, they would get between that bully and that kid. That's the kind of man that I want to follow. Part of being a man is to be strong in Christ, right? It's recognizing, as Paul did, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians chapter 4. Again, let's look at 1 Corinthians 16 again. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. Let all you do be done in love. The call to love is certainly not exclusive to, to men. It's at the heart of the Two greatest commandments where Jesus said, in essence, love God and love others. It goes for everybody, right? Those commands go for, for everybody. So men and women both should love. And, and, the, and the question of masculinity gets to precisely how that looks. It's distinctive to gender in many respects, the ways that we love. So masculinity then is more than how a man should act. It's an expression of a man's love. And its distinguishing feature is a self-sacrificing leadership. Doug Wilson describes masculinity as this, gladly assuming sacrificial responsibility. Gladly assuming sacrificial responsibility. You might say a working definition of true manhood goes like this. True manhood is man's response to God's calling for men to gladly assume sacrificial responsibility. The problem that I see, and I am not a sociologist, and you might see something different, but when I look at our culture, what I'm seeing is not men leaning into responsibility, it's men running away from it. Marrying later, you know, in their 30s, playing Fortnite still, like, hello, right? Like, not holding, being able to hold down a job or to, 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 to care for those that are around them and to do what's right, even though it's hard. Men are running from responsibility, but we need to, we need to be men that go into responsibility, sacrificial leadership. Manhood is man's response to God's calling to be men that gladly assume sacrificial responsibility. So we have to remember that God has not left us here. He's not just put us here and he says, you know, figure it out. He, he, our manhood is, 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 he left us with a profile through Christ of what it means to, to be a man. So an actual person. Now we have a flawless example of what true man, manhood looks like when we look at the life of Jesus. So this example in particular is seen in the way that he loves his bride, right? The it describes the bride of Christ as his church, okay? The way that men are commanded to emulate. Men are commanded to love their wives, their families, as Christ loves the church. Can you outdo your love of Christ's love for the church? No. So it's, it's, you're, there's always this... It's not like you arrive, right? You're always seeking to love your wife and to love your kids and to love those that are within your sphere of responsibility. You're trying to seek to love them. And that bar is so high. It's the, so high. It's the, it's the bar that says, I want you to love them in the same way that I love my bride, the church. And, and what did he do? He died for his church. He assumed sacrificial responsibility. He gave up his life for her. So in the same way, we, we are to, to, to uh, answer the masculine call and stand in the gap and stand for our families and to assume sacrificial responsibility. It was Jesus, wasn't it? Looking for the joy that was set before him, he walked head first into the pain and the loss of the cross. He he. he, he drained the cup that only he could drink, and he assumed the weight of our sins on his shoulders to pave a new humanity and to secure everlasting good. So Jesus is the man. Jesus is the man. He's the true and better man. He's the man who exemplifies and empowers us to walk in his steps 
as each of us embraces our God-given design to be men and to act like men. Micah 6, eight says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The core of a man and a man's life, the core should be his relationship with God. The man who walks humbly with God is motivated and empowered to step up and assume the difficult responsibilities that come his way. Now, for all the single ladies, for all the single ladies, is the core of the man that you are pursuing, maybe dating or getting to know, is the core of that man his relationship with God? You see, marriage doesn't make a man. Getting a job doesn't make a man. Having children doesn't make a man, though each of these opportunities gives a man a chance to show himself a man. A man is a man because God has made him male as opposed to female. And a man is is all that a man should be if he fears God, pursuing God, and ensuring God is at the very center of his life. The greatest way... Men, for those of you that are married, the greatest way that you can love your wife is to love Jesus first. The greatest way that you can serve your wife is to love Jesus first. The greatest way that you can parent your children is to love Jesus first. Jesus is not a part of your life. He is the very core of your life because all of your life flows from that. It is the love that you have for Jesus being the core of your heart and the core of your life that enables you to love in the kinds of ways that God calls us to love as he loves the church. So often we compartmentalize our lives and we say, this is my marriage and this is my parenting and this is my work and this is my recreation and this is my church life. Wrong, wrong. All of life revolves around our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Everything flows from that. The greatest way that you can love your spouse is to love Jesus way more than your spouse. Way more than your spouse. Now, it doesn't matter matter whether our parents, it doesn't matter whether our friends or anyone else considers us to be a man. Ultimately, manhood is defined by God. God creates men to be men, and his men honor his word. Let's look at a few of these specifically. So when a man is is dating a woman or he's in a, a marriage relationship, he honors that woman and he treats her in an understanding way, being kind, gentle, and protective of her. Or he he lovingly leads his wife, taking initiative and responsibility for the course and direction of the home, yet all the while listening to her and always seeking to do what is in her best interest. Uh, I I just want you to know that as I go through these, many uh, there's many men in this room that are feeling like I just want to slide off my seat and die. <laughs> right. Because you're feeling that weight of like, man, I'm just, this, this is really hard. And it is. It is really hard. And, and I can't count the number of times, I just can't count the number of times that I have failed in leading my own home and being the husband that I should be, being the parent that I should be, all those things. And part of the reason, the, the sole reason is because of sin. But part of the reason in those relationships is that you know the very things that hurt the loved ones that, are, that you love most, don't you? I know, for example, what's going to hurt my kids because I know them. I know what's going to hurt my wife because I know her. Right? That's, that's a part of the advantage and the curse of <laughs> these family relationships. You get to know one another, but you also get to know what hurts one another. And sin mars those relationships. Anything that God creates, Satan tries to destroy. All right, let's go on. When, when, when those under his care are in danger, a real man moves to protect them. 
even being willing to give up his own life. This is doing what's right even though it's hard. He does his best to understand his wife and to be to her and for her what she needs. He treats her not as someone lesser, but as an equal and fellow heir of eternal life in Jesus Christ. When he's raising children, he trains them in God's word and does not provoke them to anger. Now, this is one of those areas where, where a lot of guys feel like, I don't know how to lead my home. I, I don't know what to do uh, in leading my kids. And I, and I just want to just take that weight off you because you have these images in your mind, right? You need to be some kind, you need to be eating dinner. And then all of a sudden it gets weird because you bring out a big devotional book and you slam it on the table and your kids don't know what to do. And they're laughing and farting and carrying on and you don't know what's going on. The whole thing's falling apart. And you just think of yourself as such a failure. Right? I just want to encourage you to take that weight off. Yes, we need to, we need to be, uh, take active steps to teach our children, but there are many ways to do that, and you need to know that more of it is, is caught than taught. Right? Your kids know when you're a fraud. When they look at your life and you sit down and you're going to do your family time at the table and, and it gets all awkward and weird, they're like, Dad, come on. Like, we see your life. You don't even love Jesus. And, and, and yet you tell us we should love Jesus. So the importance, friends, of understanding that more of your life as a dad is, is caught, not taught. Should we teach? Absolutely. Right? But your life has to align with your teaching. And it's okay to say to your kids, I'm struggling in this area. It's okay to say to your kids, you know, can you forgive me? Because these are ways that we teach our kids what it means to be a Christ follower. It helps them to see that God is still working in us as he desires to work in them. If if you come in like, you know, if you're the kind of dad who like puts on the Moses robe and enters the kitchen with a staff and you know, you're holier than thou, it's it's not going to work, okay? It's not going to work because your kids know you. They know you. When, the, when a man is in the workplace, he does his best and works with all of his heart. When he's in a position of leadership, he's confident in Christ to stand for truth and to make right decisions. When he's in a position of temptation, he resists the devil and stands firm against the flesh. He does his best to provide for the home and takes measures to be sure his family would be provided for in the event of his death. So very practically, men, do you have a will? Men, do you have life insurance? Because if something happens to you, if you are the primary breadwinner in your home and you don't have a will, I can tell you many different families that are going through situations where there is no will and it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. If you don't have life insurance, you need to think about that. Are you providing for your family, your wife and your kids, if you're the primary breadwinner, are you providing for them in these ways? When he's in the church, he's willing to use his gifts to serve others and to set an example to others. When a person's in need, he's generous and he's merciful to them. When others fail him, he's willing to forgive He doesn't take revenge, for he is gentle and tender-hearted. Now, let's be clear of what we're talking about here. Gentle is strength under control. Gentle does not mean that you're a welcome mat. Gentleness is strength under control. Tender-hearted. We need to learn to be tough and tender. He studies the word. Teaches it when he has the opportunity. He's a man devoted to prayer. He's a man who loves God with all of his heart, soul, and strength. So understanding manhood is absolutely critical in understanding the family. So let me be a little bit more specific. In in general, both both you know married and single, um, young young and old. Okay, let me be a little bit more specific because I want to answer the question: What does God require of me? It can be an overwhelming question. You can feel really defeated. And there'll be times where, like I said, you're you're leading, you're trying to lead, and maybe you're leading in your home, and as a man, you're trying to step up, and your wife's just so much better at it, and so you you so advocate that and give it up and over. I I I just want to encourage you. You you gotta 
you got to keep going. You got to keep going. I, I want to spur you on to be the man of God that God desires for all of his image bearers as men. To be the kind of man that God created you to be. So the first one is this, step up, step up. Right? Lead, initiate, be a man of action. Assume it's your job and it's your moment. Hate apathy, reject passivity. In 2 Samuel, says this, and when David heard it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. Be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. There's all kinds of other scriptures you could look at. If, if you, if you uh, are having trouble writing these down, just take a picture of them. It's easier. Okay, lots of scriptures. We need to step up. Right? We, 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 we can't be apathetic. We can't be apathetic in our faith. We can't be disconnected from our families. We can't be disconnected from our, our wives. We can't be disconnected from our kids. That's apathy. It sets in. Men are prone to laziness. Uh, it's, like, it's, like, um, it's like a car, right? When it's driving and you take your, your hands off the wheel, with time it goes off the road. That's what a man is like. Uh, Men will always go towards the path of least resistance. They'll always go towards the path of laziness. This is something that I have struggled with in my life. This is something I see over and over and over in the lives of men. So step up. The second one is speak out. The silence in the midst of sin is a sin. Be courageous. Fear God, not man. Speak the truth in love. Proverbs says this, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Or in 1 Peter, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you, that, that you have in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Again, all kinds of other scriptures that you could turn to that talk about this idea of the importance of speaking out for truth, standing on on our orthodoxy. Step up, speak out. Thirdly, stand strong. Don't give in when you're challenged, attacked, or criticized. You just stand for truth. Obviously, if you're doing something wrong, uh, and you're being criticized for it, that's, that's one thing. You're being attacked for it, that's, that's entirely different. What I'm saying here is stand strong on the foundation of the truths of God's word. And, and one of the reasons we don't do that is we're fearful, I get it. We fear men, we fear cancel culture, we fear that we may not have friends, all these things. Stand strong. 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that it is, a, it is the Lord, uh, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Or this, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We are in a battle. It's a battle. All right, lots of scriptures again for this. So we step up, we speak out, we stand strong, we stay humble. Be, be, be vigilant against pride. Right? Get, get the log out of your own eye. Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. Uh, I, I have a friend uh, who I've been talking to, uh, well, it's a, it's a family uh, member that lives elsewhere. Um, you know, seriously, every time I talk to this person, it's like their spiritual gift is themselves. Everything they say is about, everything's about them. Everything is about them. Like, being humble is it's, it's not, don't think of yourself less, uh, don't think less of yourself, think of yourself less. 
right? That there's other things going on in the world. There are other needs. There are people around you that need your attention and your care and your love. It's not just about you. And, and why it's, it becomes so much about us is because we live in this victimhood culture, right? That you get more stars on the chart if you are a greatest victim. Stay humble. Let me read to this couple of verses here. This is Psalm 141.5. Um, I won't read that one, but I will read uh, this one here from 1 Peter. It says, Likewise, you who are younger are subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's sobering. God opposes the proud. God doesn't wink at it. He opposes it. But he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, all, that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Lots of scriptures on this too. And finally, we step up, we speak out, we stand strong, we stay humble, and finally we serve the king. We serve the king. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his glory and his righteousness. Hope in the eternal. Live for a greater reward. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's, I want to, I don't want you to leave here this morning, husbands, I don't want you to leave here discouraged. I want you to leave here with a challenge that's written on your heart. A challenge that says there are things in my life that I need to change. There are things in my life and priorities that I need to get sorted out and straightened out. There are places in my relationships with my spouse or my kids that I need to ask for forgiveness. The world needs men to be men by showing themselves to be men, not by the world's standards, but by God's. Biblical manhood is a matter of the heart, and it's manifested and it's, and it's matured by a commitment and an obedience to the word of God. Real men are men of integrity, internal strength in Christ and courage, willing to do what's right and to stand up for truth at all times and in all circumstances. That's the kind of, that's the, those are the kind of men that, that I want to go into battle with. That's the kind of men that I want to go into battle with. Now, I want to encourage you guys as men a couple of things before Murray comes and leads us in communion. We have a, 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 men's, a new men's study coming up, and it's on cultural apologetics. And you can go on the website, and you can sign up for this. It's six weeks. It's about every two weeks. You can find all the dates and all the information on that. And we're going to look at kind of cultural topics, things like sexuality and all kinds of things that our culture is kind of we're dealing with culturally. And we're going to look at, uh, as a man, how do we, how do we stand strong in the midst of this? How, how, do we, how do we stand in the truths of God in the midst of these things that are coming at us at a tremendous pace? So I encourage you men, sign up for that. Be part of that. Push yourselves to be part of that. The men's studies that we do, and we do them in uh, usually like four to six weeks, just kind of chunks at a time. So it gives you a chance to on-ramp new people. And if you, if you can't be part of it for a season, that's okay too. But I want to encourage you, the relationships that are built when we do these studies is really, really important. And, uh, and, and really important to spur us on and to have the accountability that we need as men and to be open and honest with the struggles that are going on in our lives and in our marriages and with our kids. So I encourage you to sign up for that. You can do that right through our website. Um, as well, we have a men's retreat in April, the end of April. It's at Dallas Valley. It's April 28th, 29th, and 30th. The 28th is a Thursday night. The 29th is a Friday. So I'm, 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 Telling you a long time in advance, if you're able to get the Friday off work, try to do that because there'll be things going on throughout the day on Friday and then Saturday. So there's two nights. If, if you can't get it off work and you can come Thursday night and you can come Friday night and stay over to Saturday, that's great. Registration will, will be up in the next week for that. So just a couple of things because I just want to encourage you that, that we need men. We need each other. 
Right? We need each other to spur each other on. So let me just pray. Marie's going to come lead us. Father, thank you for this time and for a chance to really dig into what it means to be a man. And I pray, Lord, that we would not leave here discouraged, but we would leave here challenged uh, to, to pick up the, um, the armor of God in our lives and to make the changes that we might need to make. So I pray for each man in this place. I thank you, Lord, that you created uh, men unique and distinct, that you gave men uh, specific um, qualities, if you will. And I thank you, Lord, that men and women are both equal image bearers of God, but you've made us distinctly different. We celebrate that. We're thankful for that. And we give you thanks in your name. Amen.